you very much. Um, thank you to Stephen for organising this on part of the Department of English, and thank you to Chris Pryor, as Claire said, for the, the multiple people that make this possible. And it does indeed reflect uh, how wonderful Sarah's research is. So our speaker tonight is Sarah Phillips-Castile from the Department of English Institute of African Studies at Carlton University. I'm going to keep the introduction short and sweet so that Sarah has more time to talk and for more questions to be asked. And the title of tonight's paper is Creolizing Holocaust Memory, the Jewish Caribbean and Nazi Persecution in Literature and Art. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, James. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thanks to Claire LaFolle and Chris Pryor for the, for the kind invitation. I'm really honored to be speaking with you during uh, your Black History Month. Uh, I say that because ours is in February. Uh, and I'd like also to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Ottawa, which is located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. I'm really pleased, uh, as was mentioned, that my talk is being co-sponsored by these different uh, uh, units, uh, including English, but also the Parks Institute and the Center for Imperial and Postcolonial Studies. And I'm, I'm glad about this because uh, for a while now, my research has been located at the intersection of Jewish and postcolonial studies uh, and has been aimed at trying to break down some of the barriers between these fields. Uh, so to that end, uh, today, tonight, I'll be sharing with you some of my ongoing research on Caribbean writers' invocations of Jewish historical experience, uh, and also drawing from my current study of literary and artistic representations of Black victims of Nazi persecution. I just want to emphasize at the outset that while my work uh, considers alternative framings of the past, I'm not a historian. Uh, rather, while benefiting tremendously from the work of historians, some of whom I see are, are uh, here tonight, uh, uh, while benefiting from that work, my own focus is on the role of the creative arts in making marginalized histories visible. So let me just get my slides up. Just to check, um, Claire, is that visible okay? Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. And I'm going to put a timer on so that I uh, don't... Uh, don't overstay my welcome here. Okay. So, on the 25th of March, 1941, the SS Capitan Paul Lamel departed Marseille for Fort de France, Martinique, carrying several hundred refugees. One such passenger, the anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss, later recalled that the small steamship was jam packed with Jews, foreigners, and anarchists many of them artists and intellectuals. The voyage of the Paul Lemerle is well known to scholars of Francophone Caribbean literature because it led to a really crucial encounter between one of the founding fathers of Negritude, the Martinican poet, Aimé Césaire, and another of the ship's illustrious passengers, the French surrealist, André Breton, who would become a champion of Césaire's poetry. Perhaps less familiar is the historical detail that the Paul Lamel not only carried refugee Jews, such as Levi Strauss, and political radicals, such as Breton, but also the Cuban painter Wifredo Lam, who was visible in the back row of a group portrait taken on the ship's deck. Lam, who was of Spanish, African, and Chinese descent, had been living in Paris before the war and was part of the exodus of artists and intellectuals from France following the German invasion. I want to suggest that the March 1941 voyage of the Paul Lamel is worth recalling not only for its significance in French Caribbean literary history, but also for what it conveys about the entangled relationship of uh, Europe and its colonies during World War II. In particular, the episode highlights the presence in wartime Europe of Caribbean emigres such as Wilfred Alam. As we'll see uh, a bit later in this talk, while Lamb managed to escape Europe, other Caribbean expatriates were less fortunate, and some ended up in Nazi internment and concentration camps. Simultaneously, as the story of the Polamel and the Martinican escape route uh, also highlights, refugee Jews were being propelled into various parts of the Caribbean where there were fewer visa restrictions. These interlocking wartime experiences constitute what the Ghanaian Canadian novelist Essie Adujin calls overlooked narratives. 
In her introduction to her new essay collection, Out of the Sun on Race and Storytelling, Adujan asks, why is it that we sideline some stories and mythologize others? She remarks that, quote, a world of shadows edges our written histories, and to attempt to see it is not just to recover one human story, but to piece together the larger picture hidden from us. The larger picture that I'd like to piece together for you today is one in which Jewish and African diaspora wartime experiences intersected and overlapped one another, both in Europe and in the Caribbean, in, in unexpected and often surprising ways. These entangled histories have been obscured by the compartmentalization of academic knowledge, or what the literary critic Brian Chayette calls disciplinary thinking. Yet while largely unacknowledged in standard accounts of the war, such convergences are made visible in Caribbean art and literature. In particular, the internment art of the Surinamese painter Joseph Nassi and a recent novel by the Haitian writer Louis-Philippe d'Alembert creolize Holocaust memory by tracing global transit between the Caribbean and wartime Europe. In this talk, I argue that in the context of a marginalized site, such as the Jewish Caribbean, creative mediums are especially deserving of our attention because of their capacity to preserve, recover, and circulate historical memories that have fallen between the cracks of academic disciplines. While the novelist Essie Adujan somewhat apologetically explains that she is, quote, not a historian, only a storyteller, unquote, I want to suggest that writers and visual artists are well positioned to unearth overlooked narratives and intervene into collective memory. And I'll begin in the first part of this talk with Joseph Nasi, a little known Caribbean artist of Jewish and African descent who was interned by the Nazis during World War II. Nasi and his artwork embody the creolized perspective on the wartime past that I'd like to draw attention to today. This creolizing perspective is also exemplified by uh, D'Alembert's novel of Jewish wartime refuge in Haiti, to which I'll turn in the second part of the talk. Okay, so this is part one, uh, Joseph Nassi. Buried in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's storage facility in suburban Washington, are a series of over 200 drawings and paintings by Joseph Nassi, who was born in the Dutch Caribbean colony of Suriname on the northeastern coast of South America in 1904. A painter of African, Sephardic Jewish, and European descent, Nassi immigrated to the United States as a teenager and later settled in Belgium, where he was arrested as an enemy alien in 1942. During his three-year internment in transit and civilian POW camps in Belgium and Bavaria, Nasi created a poignant and extensive visual diary of his and the other internees' experiences, including those of a, no a number of other Black internees. The Joseph Nasi collection is a unique visual document of Black civilian internment. Just as singularly, it registers a Sephardic Caribbean presence in the Nazi camp system, thereby revealing the inter interpenetration of metropolitan and colonial histories and the porousness of cultural and religious and geographic borders. Nasi stands out among artists of the camps, both for the extensiveness of his artistic production and for the diverse histories of oppression that converged in his life and work. His layered story highlights not one, but two key historical moments in which the fates of African and Jewish diaspora peoples became intertwined, their displacement after 1492 to the colonial Americas and their interconnected racial persecution by the Nazis during World War II. Before turning uh, to a, a discussion of Nazis wartime art and uh, introducing you to some of these works, I'll very briefly outline a, a bit of his Sephardic Caribbean family history, which would later, uh, I argue, complicate his work's reception. So bear with me on a little bit of a detour now uh, through colonial uh, Suriname. So Nasi, as I mentioned, was born in 1904 uh, in the Surinamese capital, Paramaribo, into a middle-class family of mixed heritage. His paternal grandmother, Sophie Nasi, was born enslaved, 
while his paternal grandfather, Jacques Nassi, was descended from a prominent Sephardic Surinamese family. Indeed, Joseph Nassi's family tree can be traced back to a founding figure of Suriname's Jewish community, the 17th century professional colonizer, David Cohen Nassi. It was David's son, Samuel Cohen Nassi, who in 1682 donated the land for Yoden Savannah, or the Jews' Savannah, a self-governing Jewish agricultural settlement on the banks of the Suriname River that reached its height in the 18th century uh, and whose ruins one can still visit uh, today, as, as you can see in the photograph there, uh, the steps of the, of the synagogue in Yoden Savannah. Behind the ruins of the Yoden Savannah Synagogue lies uh, both a Jewish cemetery dating from 1683 and a Creole cemetery dating from at least uh, 1810. The latter contains the graves of descendants of Yoden Savannah's enslaved population. Many of the surnames, like that of Joseph Nassi's grandmother, indicate either descent from or for former ownership by members of the Jewish community. In contrast to other parts of the Caribbean, in Suriname, a significant number of plantations were owned by Jews, resulting in the emergence of a prominent Eurafrican Jewish population. Joseph Nassi's Sephardic surname thus marks a deep history of intensifying contact between Jews and people of African descent in colonial Suriname amidst hierarchy and violence. Uh, that has been traced uh, uh, by the historian Aviva ben work uh, recently in a book that she just published. Today, Suriname's Jewish legacy is readily apparent in its architectural, religious, linguistic, and culinary landscape. In my view, the history of Jewish settler colonialism and creolization in Suriname is also a key context for the artwork that Joseph Nasi would produce during World War II, uh, and, and particularly for its post-war reception. But how was it that Nasi came to be in wartime Europe and what were the circumstances of his internment? So how is it that we get from uh, 18th century Joden Savannah to uh, mid 20th century uh, Belgium and Germany? Oops, sorry. After spending the first 14 years of his life in Suriname in keeping with Caribbean patterns of out migration, Nasi moved in 1918 to Brooklyn, New York where he attended high school and subsequently earned a degree from the Pratt Institute. Nasi's Pratt transcript, its transcript indicates that between 1922 and 24, he worked as an automobile driver and elevator attendant, suggesting a period of poverty and hardship. Much like a number of African Americans during the interwar years, Nasi eventually sought greater freedom uh, and prospects through emigration to Europe. The, the opportunity came in 1929 when he was sent to England to install sound systems for the first talking pictures. As was required by his employer, before embarking for Europe, Nasi applied for an American passport, filling out the form for a native citizen. In order to claim American citizenship, he changed the place and date of his birth from Paramaribo in 1904 to San Francisco in 1899. Uh, the San Francisco earthquake of 1906 had destroyed all birth records. So if you wanted to falsify your uh, place of birth and claim American citizenship, this was uh, a way to do it at the time. After working in England and France in the 1930s, Nasi eventually settled in Brussels, where he married a Belgian woman and studied painting at the Académie des Beaux-Arts. Sorry, I don't know why my... Slides are moving slowly. There we go. Paradoxically, Nazi's emancipatory migration to Europe exposed him to a different regime of racial oppression that took hold with the rise of the Third Reich. Following the German occupation of Belgium in 1940 and the entry of the US into the war in 1941, he was arrested as an enemy national in April 1942. He was first held in the Beverloo transit camp in Leopoldsburg, Belgium, after which he was transferred for the duration of the war to ELAG 7H in Laufen, Bavaria, and its subcamp, ELAG 7Z, in the neighboring village of Tidmoning. The Nazi camp officials apparently believed Nazi to be an American rather than a Dutch uh, colonial subject, a, a Dutch citizen as he would have been, and were apparently also not aware of his Jewish heritage. 
Nazis falsified US citizenship spared him the much harsher treatment to which he likely would have been subjected as a Dutch citizen of Jewish and African descent. During his three year internment, Nasi received art supplies from the international YMCA that enabled him to produce a large number of drawings and paintings comprising interior and exterior scenes, as well as portraits in pencil, ink and oil paint the work's muted palette, bleak imagery, and stark composition convey the loneliness, anxiety, and deprivations of daily life in Nazi civilian POW camps. While conditions at ELAG 7 cannot be compared to those in concentration camps, nonetheless, the prisoners had to cope with overcrowding, poor sanitation, and lack of food, as well as tremendous uncertainty and anxiety. The psychological challenges of internment find their deepest expression in Nazis moving portraits of his fellow prisoners. In keeping with other art created in the Nazi camp system, the genre that dominates Nazis corpus is portraiture. Roughly one third of the drawings are portraits as are a good number of the paintings. These portraits record a collective psychology of internment. Moreover, they offered the prisoners a space in which to work through and manage their mental anguish. Somewhat atypically for internment portraiture, however, Nasi doesn't include any textual information identifying his subjects. Nasi's prisoner portraits are also quite unusual in that many of them portray Black internees, 16 of whom were imprisoned alongside Nasi in ELAG 7. Nazis finally rendered graphite portraits of black prisoners express a quiet pathos that distinguishes them from surviving photographs that were taken in the camp, uh, such as the one on the slide from the USHMM collection. Still more intricate uh, than the drawings are Nazis oil paintings of black subjects, such as a portrait of a prisoner eating a humble meal from a bowl in the Beverly camp in 1942. Combining portraiture with the activities of daily life this striking work firmly situates its subject in a camp environment signaled by the armed guard and barracks that appear through the window in the upper left corner of the canvas. In a composition that may have been inspired by the 17th century Spanish painter Diego Velazquez, the half length figure of the prisoner stares out from the canvas, his face and torso turned three quarters toward the viewer. As in Velasquez's kitchen scene, Christ in the house of Martha and Mary, Nasi's central figure clasps a bowl and metallic utensil that catch the light while a contextualizing scene is revealed through an opening in the wall behind him. So we have this uh, picture within a picture. Substituting a black prisoner for Velasquez's distressed maid and a German guard for Velasquez's biblical characters, Nasi adapts the conventions of European genre painting to novel circumstances, thereby dignifying his subject and imbuing him with psychological depth. Another established genre that Nasi adapted to his purposes was that of the civic group portrait. In one of his uh, more complex compositions, Nasi portrays nine black prisoners in their cramped barracks in Titmoning Castle in 1943. Here, the thick application of paint and gray and brown tones generate an atmosphere of airless enclosure. In the background, one prisoner faces away from the viewer at a silent piano, while four others sit or lie in their bunks, one of them sleeping or staring at the ceiling, his bare feet protruding corpse-like from a blanket. In the foreground of the painting, three seated figures are occupied with preparing or eating food and playing the guitar. Meanwhile, a fourth figure stares out from the canvas at the viewer. Much like the Beverloo prisoner, his raised eyebrows and direct gaze invite us to engage with and witness the scene. Head tilted to one side, right hand resting on his knee, shoulders slumped and legs splayed, he appears resigned to his fate, his passive pose conveying the despair and helplessness of his situation. Nasi's group portrait of the black tit moaning internees con communicates in a concentrated fashion possible only through a visual medium, the prisoner's psychological and material predicament. The painting introduces several key themes, food as a pr primary concern, art making within the camp, and the psychological toll of indefinite incarceration. 
The painting juxtaposes the central seated figure's inactivity with the actions of the other prisoners, reading, toasting bread, music, and art making. One man plays the piano while another strums on a guitar whose vibrant red and orange tones draw our eye, infusing color into an otherwise drab scene. In the upper left-hand corner of the canvas, we see Nasi himself at work at an easel while perched on a bunk. Indeed, in this painting, Nasi not only registers his presence through his artist signature, which he almost always includes in his wartime works, but also incorporates a self-portrait. Further attention is drawn to art making through the painting that hangs prominently on the wall uh, above the sleeping prisoner's bunk. Possibly produced by one of the internees, the painting's presence suggests how the prisoners may have transformed their material environment in an effort to, in Jane Desilliers' phrase, reshape spaces of internment into places of survival. It's significant that Nasi depicts himself here not as an isolated figure, but as a member of a, a group of Black prisoners confronting a common predicament. He deploys the genre of the group portrait to capture a collective experience of racialized internment. The composition suggests the psychological, emotional, and political relationships forged among the prisoners by the conditions of their internment, which included being bunked together in a confined space. Notably, however, each of the prisoners appears lost in his own thoughts. The men do not converse, and their gazes are directed away from one another. Thus, while their spatial assembly can be read as an affirmation of group solidarity, Nasi maintains a sense of their individuality while hinting at possible fragmentation. In keeping with the genre of civic portraiture, Nasi's composition seeks to balance the simultaneous expression of group solidarity, equality, and individuality. The following year in 1944, Nasi painted a poignant double portrait of two black prisoners interned in Titmoning, uh, who likely were the African-American jazz musicians, Johnny Mitchell and Henry Crowder. And I thank Eve Brandell for helping me to, to identify them. I believe she's here to, uh, tonight. Um, as in the group portrait, uh, here Nasi presents the two prisoners in the austere claustrophobic atmosphere of the medieval castle that served as their barracks. In contrast to the stiff motionless posture characteristic of individual portraits, the men's more casual poses convey their enforced intimacy and shared identity as prisoners. Mitchell is seated on the top bunk of a bed playing the guitar while Crowder lies on the bunk below reading, his head propped up in his left hand. Intent on their activities, the prisoners' knitted brows and heavily shadowed faces convey psychological challenges of internment that are not captured by textual and photographic records of ELAC-7. Also, as in the group portrait here, Mitchell's guitar occupies the foreground of the image and is positioned slightly off center. While Mitchell's body and face turn away from the viewer, his guitar is seen head on. Its luminous orange tones draw the viewer's eye, while the bright white pages of Crowder's book below provide a secondary focal point. The guitar and the book protrude out of the gloom that envelops the two men, signaling the spiritual sustenance that music and reading offered in a context of profound uncertainty and disempowerment. Similar to the earlier painting, an image is affixed to the wall behind the two prisoners. Possibly a pinup or artwork created by one of the internees, the image's introduction into otherwise stark surroundings suggests how prisoners sought to reshape and thereby regain some control over their material environment. Nasi's internment art uh, illustrates the power of visual media to register a hyper-visible prisoner population that nonetheless has remained hidden from view in the collective memory of the war. Yet while recording the particular conditions of Black civilian internment, Nasi also promotes a relational understanding by positioning the Black prisoners' experiences as intimately connected with those of other victim groups he represents, uh, including a number of Polish Jewish prisoners. Moreover, by virtue of Nasi's own Caribbean background and the colonial backgrounds of some of the other prisoners he portrayed, the Nasi collection reveals the entanglement of European and colonial wartime experience. After his liberation in May 1945, 
Nasi remained in Germany for a full year, unwilling to leave until he could securely transport his artworks back to Belgium. Nasi's determination to keep his collection intact likely reflected his awareness both of its monetary value and its value as historical evidence. While the names of Nasi's subjects are missing from their portraits, the persistent presence of Nasi's own signature on the artworks signals his understanding of the artist's role as witness. Yet despite his evident desire to preserve his art as an historical record, the Nasi collection is virtually unknown today. In exhibitions that were mounted in the early post-war years before the concept of the Holocaust and the specificity of Jewish victimhood have been established, Nazi's works were presented in universalist terms as prisoner art as, and as evidence of the triumph of the human spirit. Nazi's interment art continued to be exhibited in Brussels through the mid 1950s, after which it appears not to have been shown again until the 1980s. By this point, the Holocaust had come to be understood as a distinct event targeting a specific victim group. Accordingly, the collection now began to be promoted as Holocaust art and Nazi's Jewish lineage became much more focal. Yet in the 1980s and 90s, uncertainty surrounding the authenticity of Nazi's Jewishness and doubts regarding whether his artworks could rightfully be considered Holocaust art increasingly became obstacles to the collection's recognition and it faded out of view. These diverging post-war assessments of the Nazi collection can be understood as part of a process that Edward Linenthal refers to as negotiations over the boundaries of Holocaust memory. Negotiations that I argue were significantly complicated by Nazi's creolized Caribbean Jewishness. Okay, I'm gonna um, turn now to the second part uh, of the talk. So in April 1942, the same month in which Joseph Nasi was arrested in Brussels, the Surinamese governor reluctantly agreed to accept over 100 European Jewish refugees. The refugees arrived from Lisbon that December on the Portuguese steamship, the Nyasa. After a period of internment, they were housed in Paramaribo in barracks on the Weidestraat, the very same street on which Joseph Nasi's family had lived during his early years. This spatial conjunction invites us not only to trace the movement of Caribbean expatriates such as Nazi into wartime Europe, but also to reverse direction and follow the paths of Jewish refugees who fled Europe for the Caribbean. Moving now from art to literature and from wartime testimony to post-war fiction, I'll offer as my second example, a recent Haitian novel that reconstructs the little known history of Jewish refugee flight to the Caribbean. As a distinctive medium of cultural memory, contemporary literature mounts a key challenge to, to disciplinary silos that obscure historical connections between the Caribbean and World War II. A case in point is a small body of poetry and fiction that retrieves a forgotten history of Jewish refugee flight to the islands in Caribbean mainland. The most recent contribution to this small subgenre of Holocaust literature is, I would argue, also the richest. Haitian author Louis-Philippe d'Alembert's 2017 novel, Avant que les ombres s'effacent, uh, or Before the Shadows Fade. D'Alembert's novel tracks the traumatic dispersion of members of the Polish Jewish Schwarzberg family to Haiti, Cuba, Israel, and the United States in the late 1930s. Steeped in references to Jewish religious and cultural life and punctuated by Yiddish and Hebrew phrases, the novel at the same time brings into focus the Haitian intellectual and cultural setting of its refugee protagonists resettlement, as well as Haitian diasporic presence, uh, presences in wartime Europe. Still more strikingly, D'Alembert situates Haiti's offer of asylum to Jewish refugees as emanating from its revolutionary tradition of emancipating itself from slavery. Centering a Haitian perspective on the war, avant que les ombres s'effacent, not only exemplifies the capacity of fiction to recover a lost episode of Jewish history, but illustrates how this act of recovery can creolize and decolonize Holocaust memory. Bell's novel can be read alongside a series of recent studies by historians Marian Kaplan, Eric Jennings, and Joanna Newman, 
that address Holocaust uh, uh, refugee flight to the Dominican Republic, Martinique, and the British West Indies, respectively. Haiti, however, has not yet been the focus of such scholarship, tending instead to be introduced as a comparator in discussions that draw parallels between Holocaust and Haitian refugees. A more direct historical link between Haiti and the Holocaust was suggested by a post that appeared on the website of the American Joint Distribution Committee shortly after the 2010 earthquake in Haiti. Entitled From the Archives, Haiti Helped Holocaust Refugees, the post noted that in a little known piece of JDC history, roughly 150 refugees had made their way to Haiti. In the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's a Holocaust Encyclopedia, the search term Haiti produces only a photo of signatories to the 1950 Genocide Convention. By contrast, a USHMM collection search yields dozens of hits, including photographs of Jewish refugees in Haiti and oral histories that make reference to Haiti. When official histories overlook certain experiences, more localized or extra institutional initiatives can work to fill in these gaps. A notable attempt to bring the story of Haitian wartime refuge to light was a small Montreal exhibition entitled Juifs et Haitiens, une histoire oubliée, uh, Jews and Haitians, a Forgotten History. Mounted in 2010, the exhibit sought to, uh, and I quote from the panel text, evoke a forgotten history, that of the actions taken by the Haitian government to save Jews from Nazi barbarism. Accordingly, the exhibition panels displayed naturalization documents, photographs, and letters recording the stories of individual refugees who fled to Haiti. The Montreal exhibition in turn served as a key source for what has arguably proven a more effective vehicle for circulating this forgotten memory, d'Alembert's acclaimed novel Avant que les ombres s'effacent. Storing, reshaping, and transmitting the memory of Jewish refuge in Haiti, Dallembert's novel illustrates how fiction can intervene into memory cultures by advancing new or alternative narratives. It supports memory studies theorist Astrid Earle's contention that literature is, quote, characterized by its ability and indeed tendency to refer to the forgotten and repressed, as well as the unnoticed, unconscious, <laughs> and unintentional aspects of our dealings with the past. Literature does so, Earl explains, by bringing together different memory systems to generate, quote, new surprising and otherwise inaccessible archives of cultural memory, end quote. In Dallobel's case, the memory systems in question are those of European Jewish Holocaust memory on the one hand and Haitian slavery and revolutionary memory on the other. So just to give you a quick um, overview of the plot of the novel, uh, the central protagonist, Dr. Ruben Schwartzberg, is born in Poland in 1913 to a Jewish family that moves five years later to Berlin in the first of a series of displacements around which the novel's tripartite structure is organized. Following Kristallnacht, Ruben and his uncle Joe see their family members safely off on a ship to America only to find themselves arrested and deported to Buchenwald. After their release, Reuben and Joe secure passage on the ill-fainted St. Louis. While docked in the Havana Harbor, Joe injures himself in a desperate attempt to obtain entrance to Cuba, while Reuben is forced for his part to return to Europe. Finding himself alone and without resources in Paris, Reuben befriends the Haitian emigre community there uh, and they take him under their wing and secure him safe passage to Haiti, taking advantage of Haiti's recent decree granting citizenship in absentia to refugees from, na from Nazism. Arriving in Port-au-Prince in 1939, Ruben establishes a medical practice and settles into a villa in the countryside of Montagne Noire. The problem of the disappeared lies at the heart of the novel which summons the lives of those whose stories have been forgotten. Drawn from the Song of Songs, the novel's title signals the imperative to preserve memories before they are lost to history, before the shadows fade. Throughout the novel, Ruben's memories are threatened with erasure. We repeatedly witness him trying to fix in his mind particular details and scenes that he's about to leave behind. 
Compounding the difficulty of preserving memory is Rubin's reticent disposition. Quiet by nature, he withholds his recollections of the past. And it's only the devastation of the 2010 earthquake in Haiti that finally unlocks his tale. Uh, and I quote uh, from the novel, never since Buchenwald had he smelled death so close. Like tens of thousands of other Haitians, he could have lost his life in the earthquake. It would have been a shame, Deborah had said, to have left with this story that wasn't only his own, but also that of the family, that of all the survivors who hadn't known how or hadn't wanted to tell it, that of the millions of anonymous disappeared. In the two short interludes that divide the German, French, and Haitian sections of the novel, we see Rubin recounting his personal and family history to his grandniece Deborah as she sits with him on his veranda in the Haitian night. Just as Rubin transmits these memories of refugee flight to Deborah, so the novel transmits them to the reader. Notably, however, the novel foregoes the first person testimonial voice on which much Holocaust fiction relies instead filtering Rubin's tale through Deborah's post-memorial presence, as well as an omniscient third-person narrator. Depriving the narrative of the immediacy and intimacy of the testimonial mode, D'Alembert opts instead for a highly mediated narrative structure that thematizes the difficulty of transmitting memory. Foregrounding the acts of narration and transmission, the novel at once produces memory and reflects on its production. Significantly, the omniscient narrator of the novel appears to be Haitian, occasionally interjecting Haitian folkloric imagery into Rubin's tale, uh, including in the European uh, portions of, of the text and the account of Buchenwald and so forth. Rubin's story is thus mediated, uh, his Holocaust story is mediated through a Haitian uh, perspective that challenges a narrowly European account of the war uh, as well as the image of Haiti as a failed state by advancing this uh, uh, alternative idea of uh, Haiti as, as offering asylum. The novel's epilogue revisits Ruben Schwartzberg's Berlin neighborhood 75 years after his departure and evokes the Stolpersteine or stumbling stones that have been affixed to the pavement in front of the former homes of Hitler's victims. Some 75,000 Stolpersteine have now been installed in eight European countries to create the world's largest decentralized memorial. Like the Stolpersteine, D'Alembert's novel performs a memorial function, making visible the absent presence of individual victims. Yet the Jewish refugee family the novel commemorates is an imaginary one. Moreover, the minimalism of the Stolpersteine, which provide only the name, birth year, place, and date of death of the victim, contrasts with the fully imagined life world that the narrative form of the novel supplies. D'Alembert's particular intervention into memory culture is made possible by the detailed semi-fictional image of the past that his novel produces. Indeed, while the novel's central protagonist is invented, the memories it transmits are only partially fictitious. D'Alembert surrounds his fictional protagonist with a host of real historical figures, including a number of Haitian intellectuals uh, and writers, as well as Otto and Shlomo Zaltzman, Austrian Jewish refugees to Haiti, whose story partly inspired the novel. Moreover, the novel also recovers historical facts that are now forgotten or never were widely known, including Haiti's offer at, uh, at the uh, Evian conference to take in 50,000 Jewish refugees, Haiti's May 1939 decree enabling refugee Jews to be naturalized in absentia, Haiti's December 1941 declaration of war against the Third Reich and Italy, and the imprisonment of a Haitian Jamal saint Nicolas uh, in Nazi labor and concentration camps between 1943 and 45. I'll come back to uh, jean Saint Nicolas in a moment. Blending fact and fiction is, of course, a common strategy of Holocaust novels. Unique to Avant que les ombres s'effacent, however, is the range of historical references, the particular memory systems that it integrates into the fictional world it constructs. Referencing both Jewish and Haitian figures and events extending as far back as the Haitian Revolution of 1791 to 1804, D'Alembert recombines these historical details within the world of the novel to generate new meanings. 
And it's worth noting that in merging these memory systems against the backdrop of World War II, D'Alembert is not being anachronistic. Rather, as we saw with the story of the Capitaine uh, Paul Lamel, with which I opened this talk and which uh, Eric Jennings has, has written about, uh, the transformative encounters between European and Caribbean artists and intellectuals that D'Alembert's fiction stages were in fact a significant byproduct of the war. In keeping with this history of wartime cross-cultural encounter, the novel constructs a key counterpoint between the Jewish refugee, Ruben Schwartzberg, and the Haitian concentration camp victim, Jean-Marcel Nicolas. The novel recalls the true story of Nicolas, a Haitian medical student who was arrested in Paris for collaborating with the resistance and imprisoned in Buchenwald, Dora, and Mittelbau. In the novel, Ruben encounters Nicolas in Buchenwald, where the Haitian presents himself as an American named Johnny Nicholas. Nicholas' uh, incarceration by the Nazis and practice of masquerading as an American recall another Caribbean victim of the camps whom we met earlier, Joseph Nassi. Indeed, if on the one hand, D'Alembert re recovers the forgotten journeys of European Jewish refugees to the Caribbean, he simultaneously records a reverse migratory flow of Caribbean expatriates into Europe and their wartime travails. The novel suggests that these Caribbean uh, victims of the Nazis, such as Jean-Marc Saint-Nicolas and Joseph Nassi, also deserve to be remembered as part of the more global story of the war. While disciplinary divisions between fields such as Holocaust studies and Black studies tend to compartmentalize different victim groups, within the connective literary framework that D'Alembert constructs, their stories become closely intertwined. So just to wrap up and, and conclude now. In D'Alembert's retelling, the wartime experiences of Europe and the Caribbean of Jewish and African diaspora peoples are profoundly interlocking. To convey these historical confluences, D'Alembert harnesses the fictional privileges of literary narrative, mediating between the real and the imaginary and combining memory systems in unexpected and often quite startling ways. As a vehicle of cultural memory, avant que les ombres s'effacent, generates images of the wartime past that transform our perception of it, moving Haiti to the center of the story and in so doing, uncovering global dimensions of Jewish experience. As we've seen, the kinds of cross-cultural wartime encounters that D'Alembert imaginatively reconstructs are powerfully recorded in Joseph Nassi's internment art. Both D'Alembert's novel and Nassi's paintings and drawings exemplify the capacity of the creative arts to draw apparently disconnected histories into relation, thereby serving as a corrective to disciplinary thinking. It's not an accident then that while Nasi is a largely forgotten figure, he is remembered in literature, briefly appearing in a novel by the African-American writer, John A. Williams. In Williams's 1999 novel, Clifford's Blues, a fictional black prisoner at Dachau hears of Nasi and the other black men who are imprisoned alongside him in Elog 7. In a letter that closes the novel, the reader learns that, quote, after the war, Nasi managed somehow to gather all the paintings he'd done, so they were available after he died and went on a tour across the US, Israel, and Europe. By invoking Joseph Nasi in his novel, Williams remediates and recirculates the memories preserved in Nasi's visual chronicle of internment. As this passage uh, from Williams's novel suggests, alongside the historical scholarship that's currently emerging on both World War II era Jewish sanctuary in the Caribbean and on Black victims of Nazi persecution, it's worthwhile attending, I think, to literary and artistic representations such as those I've discussed today. In the context of the Jewish Caribbean, creative mediums are especially deserving of our consideration because of their mnemonic function, their capacity to preserve and imaginatively recover cross-cultural encounters and migratory histories that have fallen between the cracks of academic disciplines. The kinds of confluences between wartime Europe and the Caribbean that Nazis internment art and Dallembel's fiction foreground are not captured by standard historical accounts. 
Instead, European and colonial wartime histories have been compartmentalized, severed from one another. As I indicated earlier, this same separative logic has shaped the reception history of the Joseph Nasi collection, conforming neither to established definitions of Holocaust art nor to a normative understanding of Jewishness, Nasi's artworks have been consigned to invisibility. Nasi's paintings and drawings are not only passive objects onto which narrative containers are imposed by curators and scholars, however. They can also be understood as active agents that have the capacity to rewrite such narratives. Equally, by centering a Haitian perspective on the war, D'Alembert's ambitious novel actively intervenes into collective memory and reorients our understanding of the past. Turning to alternative forms of doc documentation and remembrance, such as internment art and contemporary fiction, thus enables us not only to recover dimensions of wartime experience that fall outside established frames of knowledge, but also to re-examine the frames themselves. This task becomes all the more urgent in our current moment of reckoning with the legacies of slavery and colonialism. Thank you. Close this. Thank you, Sarah. That was brilliant. Um, rich, far reaching, complex. <laughs> Looking at the memorial function of, of memory of fiction rather than um, anything else, and the kind of the, those questions of fact and fiction, which sort of interest. I think all of us and uh, being between the real and the imaginary. I mean, just just so many so many things there to, to think about. Um, Claire, I can't remember with the online version. Do we have a break or do we just plow straight through with questions? Questions. Excellent. That's a very good answer. <laughs> okay, so can I open it to the floor, please? If there are any questions from anybody, please raise a hand or put your camera on and and speak. Anushka. Hello. Um, I thought that was excellent. Thank you so much. Incredibly interesting. I didn't know about any of the things that you talked about, but I loved listening to it. Um, I was interested, obviously, you're talking about these creative modes of fiction and art making and the people making them and the reception of it. Um, but I'm I'm curious more about D'Alembert and how he came to write about this topic and how he did so you know how he did it so so deftly and and kind of sympathetically um and if you could just talk a bit more about his connection to that history that would be that would be great yeah thank you thank you so much uh for the response and for the the question that's a great question uh i'm really struck by dallin bell's novel because i had looked um previously uh in my book calypso jews at a series of caribbean literary texts that engaged with uh, the story of, of uh, Jewish refugees arriving in the Caribbean in, in the late 1930s, but none of them had pursued the story as in depth as D'Alembert does. And his novel came out after um, I, my book was published, so I didn't get a chance to engage with it there. Um, and, and I do find his, his work is, is, is very distinctive in, in the, um, again, in the, in the depth and sustained way that he investigates this Jewish uh, story, even as he's reframing it very strikingly um, through this lens of, of this Haitian revolutionary memory uh, and the fact that he you know uh, intersperses Yiddish phrases and Hebrew and so forth he has this um, um, this tremendous engagement I don't have a full answer to your question about where this comes from there is a dedication in the novel to uh, um, a man with a Jewish name whom he seems to have known in childhood uh, and I haven't been able to trace yet who that is if anyone can help me please uh, tell me because my I'm very curious because I know that in the case of some other Caribbean writers as um, as young people as children they knew Jewish refugees uh, in, uh, in, um, in the places that they were living in the Caribbean and so there was a kind of autobiographical contact and I'm I haven't been able to ascertain yet whether that's um, he does say that part of the inspiration uh, for the book comes from this, um, this individual. He did also engage with a memoir by these Austrian Jewish refugees I had mentioned, uh, and, uh, and, and, and clearly just did a tremendous amount of, of research into this story. But I think there's a real um, motivation to try to bring this story to light in uh, because it hasn't been uh, registered, uh, even as 
um, historians uh, have been um, starting to look at other Caribbean sites of Jewish refuge, Haiti, except in a, a couple of Francophone uh, uh, his, um, historical studies has really not been discussed in, in this context. So, um, so I think he's quite passionate about, you know, bringing this, this story to light. But I'm still investigating <laughs> to try to understand exactly uh, where this comes from. Um, and uh, he, I should say also, in terms of his larger corpus, um, the themes of errancy, uh, of um, of being uprooted, uh, nomadism, and so forth, are ones that that interest him a lot. And he has a more recent novel where he has another Jewish character appear. I think a Nigerian Jewish figure. Um, so he's clearly uh, interested in Jewishness uh, beyond just this, this one text, um, but also Jewishness in connection with, um, with, with exile, uprootedness, uh, errancy. Yeah, make sure it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, any, any other questions? This chair. <laughs> Joe Newman, who's muted. Can I ask one then? Pos apologies for that. Right. I'm going to be the first person to be on mute and talk. <laughs> <laughs> and Sarah, that was just fascinating. It was oh, fantastic talk. Know. And it just, uh, well, it just lights up so many areas of the world that I researched in from different, you know, different ways and different contexts and different imagination. And it made me wish that I could see more of that cultural production in a sense in, in, what, I, in what I studied in Trinidad and Barbados and Jamaica, where I came across the uh, calypsos as an expression, perhaps, you know, of, of sort of understanding or imagining the Jewish experience and making connections to the Black African Caribbean experience. Um, but you know, as as your scholarship continues, there is more and more emerging, I think, of the comparisons of the different experiences during uh, the war. And there's more uh, perhaps collections that are emerging from the USHMM or other places that actually give artistic or literary expression to how people felt and how it was reproduced and how memory is produced through, through those mediums. So I just wanted to thank you and say how fascinating it's been. Oh, thank you, Joanne. I'm honored. I feel very nervous speaking in the company of historians because I'm afraid I'm going to get the, some of the details wrong. But I've, I'm really indebted, of course, to your work um, and and thinking of the Dallenbell's novel uh, and the, the sort of how it references the, the earthquake. I don't know if you remember, Joanna, that we met at the time of the Haitian earthquake when we were in Jamaica in, in 2010. So very um, that's very much uh, in my mind as well. Um, yeah, I, I have the sense that I'm sort of just scratching the surface here, at, at just in terms of uh, looking at the artistic and literary side of this um, conjunction of Caribbean and Jewish uh, cultures. And I think also if um, uh, we go back into 19th, 18th century even, that there is a lot of literary material there that has yet to be looked at. So. Um, so I think you know um, there's there's a lot of work to to be done in this area, and I, I I feel that I'm just sort of at the at the beginnings, and 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 hoping that others will also um, uh, take this up as well. But thank you so much, Joanna. Can I ask a question then? Yeah, thank you so much. It's, um, it's yeah, really inspiring, really rich. Um, and I wanted to ask about uh, Nasi. And of course, you don't want to bring all the to bring back all the compartmentalization and divisions that you've tried to to go beyond. But I wonder what he did after 1945 in terms of painting and how he himself engages with this question of Holocaust and Jewishness. I think you mentioned that, did he represent some uh, Jewish or saint Anise in his painting or where does he situate himself in this narrative and memory of the Holocaust? Yeah, thank you. Um... Nasi's story is very obscure, and I've been uh, I've been spending um, 
quite a number of years now trying to piece together the fragments of, of, of this. And so I, there are a lot of gaps still in my knowledge of, of, uh, of, his, uh, of his career. He didn't leave any written testimony or text or hardly any, there's just a few fragments. So it's very difficult to reconstruct some of, um, some of those asks. What I've been focusing more on is the reception history of the, of the collection, which I am able to trace in the USHMM um, archives. Uh, and also uh, at the Jewish Museum in, in Belgium that also has a, a few of his works. Um, but it's very, it's been, and I've been um, trying to locate his, his descendants and speak with them and meet with them. And, um, and it's been a bit of a labor of love trying to put this all, all together. Um, he uh, uh, did continue, I think, to work as an artist after the war. Um, but he's really just completely unknown, you know, not in, represented in, in museum collections except for this wartime work. Um, his his uh, artworks do seem to be kind of circulating. And I think some of the former prisoners um, uh, own some of them as well. And they're sort of still around beyond the ones that are in Washington in the, uh, in the USHMM's collection. Um, the collection was uh, bought in the 1980s by a Belgian Jewish uh, survivor named Severin Wunderman. And he, it was he who really promoted the collection as Holocaust art and tried to um, make the case that way. And his own status as a Holocaust survivor, I think, you know, partly helped him to, to, to um, promote the, the work in that way. And also uh, put great emphasis, as I had mentioned, on Nazis' Jewishness. Um, but I think that became and I just really touched on this in the talk, but that became uh, a real um, complication in a sense because of the lack of familiar, familiarity with what Jewishness means in the Caribbean context where it's much more fluid. So in the USHMM archives, you can see uh, the, uh, in the 1980s uh, and early 90s, uh, the, there's this attempt to establish his Jewish credentials in order to make the case that this is Holocaust art. And so they're writing to um, the rabbi of the Jewish uh, congregation in Suriname to say, you know, was he really, can you tell us that he was really Jewish? But the truth is, I think that the way, again, Jewishness operates in the Caribbean, and particularly in this Euro-African Jewish um, background that Nasi had, is that it tends to be, again, very fluid and not um, to, to uh, correspond to a kind of halakhic uh, definition of Jewishness. So, um, so I think that's part of the reason why the collection uh, uh, has been so invisible. Um, and particularly after this man, uh, Wonderman donated the collection to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, it was just at the moment when the USHMM was establishing itself when it was opening. And I think it was a bit difficult for, for the curators there to figure out how to um, incorporate this collection into their mandate and sort of what to do with it. And you can see them discussing, you know, what headings should we put this under? They do one small exhibit of it in 1997 of a few works, I think about 20, uh, and, and that's it. And, and so I think that it's just been, um, it doesn't fit the categories. And so I think that's part of the reason why the collection has been so unknown. But it's quite extraordinary to see it because it's so large and extensive and because um, of also the stories of the other prisoners, uh, and particularly the black prisoners that it records, but also as I, yes, as I mentioned, there were um, uh, Jewish prisoners uh, there who had been able to obtain Latin American papers and that enabled them to uh, stay in that camp. There were, there's a quite a diverse prisoner population, lots of British uh, prisoners as well. So he is documenting all of these, um, uh, all of these prisoners. And I think it's, uh, I tried to make the point that I think he connects these different victim groups um, by, uh, by taking such a kind of comprehensive uh, approach uh, to this act of, of, of documentation, of artistic uh, documentation. I don't know if that answers the, the, the yeah, question. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Sure. Brian, you've appeared on the screen. So uh, do you have a question? Uh, this was re a really fascinating talk, uh, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, I, I was just thinking, uh, and in a way, your the last phrase that you used, um, artistically documenting, um, the, the 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 testimonial mode, which 
is, is kind of invoked and, and uh, in relation to photography and uh, and then uh, um, left out because there's so little information. I was just wondering about the limits of um, the artistic mode. <laughs> uh, you've talked uh, eloquently about the, the, the strengths of it, especially in bringing together different histories uh, and histories that are normally uh, disconnected. But I was just wondering about the, the limits of, of the artistic mode and, and, and the fact that, that um, you can't go along the, the testimonial road. Thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, a great question. Uh, and I, I guess, um, first of all, I would say that I think that's another reason why the collection hasn't gotten that much attention is that there is a sense that photography has much greater documentary value and therefore drawing, painting, you know, doesn't have that same, um, that same uh, value as historical evidence. So there's also that, you know, that aspect to the story. But in terms of the limitations of it as, um, as a form of documentation, one of the great frustrations is that he doesn't record any textual information. As I mentioned, many other um, comparable kinds of uh, portraits uh, drawn, you know, in, in uh, internment camps, including in ELAG 7, had quite a lot of textual information about the name, the prisoner number, the location, and so forth. Um, in, in fact, there, in the USHM collection, there's a drawing of Nasi himself by another artist in the camp that, that records all of these details. And yet Nasi does not do that. And it's particularly frustrating uh, for me in terms of the black prisoners he, he portrays because I've been trying to understand who they were and to trace their identities. So um, there, it is very limited in that sense. And I've been puzzling over why he doesn't include that information. His name is always there very prominently, but not details about, uh, about these other prisoners. Uh, and I, I think, I mean, I'm not, I'm still not really sure what the answer is. It may be that he was not concerned that they were going to lose their lives. So there wasn't a sense of urgency about recording their identities. I, I think that the, um, interpretation I have at the moment that I've been sort of working through is, is the idea that what he was really interested in was more of this idea of a collective psychology of internment rather than um, so much these individual uh, biographies uh, and that that this sort of psychological function of both art making and also exhibiting the art for the other prisoners was paramount. There is, I, I did find evidence that uh, they had an exhibit of his work within the camp during the war so um, imagining what it was like for the prisoners to look at these works and how that may have helped them work through some of their own um, uh, challenges uh, of, their, of their condition, I think is quite an interesting function. And that's quite different from, an, from a docu uh, testimonial function uh, post-war. So I guess there's the sort of what, what, what the value of the artwork was for um, them during the war as a way also just to occupy their time because they were, you know, um, that was one of the challenges of, of, of the uh, internment camp that he was in uh, versus for the post-war researcher who sort of wants this, I think this more um, um, documentary um, uh, a dimension to it and, and may not be, be frustrated by this um, way in which in a way Nasi withholds that from us. So I, I find that very interesting, and and, I'm, and in some ways I'm still you know just sort of puzzling over it. Yes, I, I thought what you said about the idea of the collective um, it made me think of Charlotte Delbo as well, who very much want, wants to uh, uh, in her work, which is part poetry, uh, uh, part testimony, part uh, fiction. Or, but she always wants to try and get a sense of the collective. Mm. So the, I think that's well worth pursuing. I and mean, that's really interesting, really interesting. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, I suppose, I suppose Brian's question is one of the things I was gonna talk about, which was the, the way in which you um, talk about the merging of fact and fiction in the literature, but then it's harder to do that with the, with the paintings. And, you mentioned that someone, perhaps on this call, had helped you identify uh, Crowder and Mitchell, and I just yeah. wanted to know a little bit more about that and how and how you use that kind of 
foregrounding of the factual within the, the fiction and how do you work out what's factual and what's fictional when it comes to artwork in so in a sense related to Brian's question yeah and um and actually this isn't quite answering the question but just to add some another kind of piece to that something that interests me a lot about the figures I'm uh looking at in terms of these um uh, African diaspora people who were living in, in Europe during the war and got caught up in it, and in some cases in prison, like Nasi. In many cases, there is, uh, and this was this is the case with Nasi, and also with this Haitian Jean Marcel Nicola, who I mentioned. There is this also self fictionalization where they fictionalize their identities in certain ways, passing as American in particular. Um, so, so there's a way in which the um, even the historical details have fictional elements to them, and I find that. Um, that very interesting. Um, in terms of how I've been able to uh, identify um, some of the figures in these paintings, uh, some of it is from just finding photographs, uh, including, I mean, I'd shown one uh, photograph in one of the slides uh, that's in the USHM MM collection that was taken uh, in the internment camp uh, of two uh, African-American uh, jazz musicians performing in the camp. So in some cases, just looking at visual uh, resemblances between them. I've also been looking at African-American press coverage uh, of the camp. The, the African-American press was one of the only places that seemed to be interested in what was happening to, um, to Black people during the war and, and to, to the stories that those who were released and made it back um, in some cases to the US you know, were interviewed and so forth. So from that, that's one source that I've been able to draw on to try to trace um, the stories uh, of, of, of some of these uh, prisoners. Um, but I, I'm not sure that it will ever be possible to identify uh, all of them um, because in some cases they're just extremely obscure. But in the, in the case of those who were um, jazz uh, musicians and had significant careers, there's a bit more of a um, information available about them. So it's really just looking at visual um, uh, resemblances and then this uh, African American press coverage as well and interviews with some of the uh, the former prisoners that were uh, uh, um, printed uh, in in these newspapers in the 1940s. Thank you, Sarah. I suppose there's that tension between the two sides of, of the research and the trial of wanting to identify and then not wanting to identify kind of for that there's a dual purpose going on. Okay, that's, that's lovely. Thank you ever so much. Um, do we have any more questions from the audience? Okay. Maybe I can just add, James, to just one more thought on your question is, you know, with thinking about the Dallin Bell novel and its combination of fact and fiction, I'm interested in how he uses the, you know, the fictional elements in order to kind of bring the, the factual to light. So, I think it's in a way because he has that poetic license to fictionalize um, and, and reconstruct something that in a way is, is not available in the historical record um, that he's able to then bring, you know, bring to light um, some of, of what is available but is unremembered. Or as one, um, I was reading an essay about the Haitian asylum offer that's just come out and, and, and this critic talks about it as being inconceivable, you know, that there is this sort of notion that how could this little nation, Haiti, be a place that would offer refuge to Jewish refugees? There's something inconceivable about that. And so um, this, I think this fictional license that the novelist has enables, um, enables him to bring that, that story uh, forward and that, that I find uh, uh, really interesting. And in some ways parallel too with when we think about slavery fiction, um, post-slavery fiction and how, you know, um, the historical record, the, the archive does not record, for the most part, the experiences of the enslaved, but the novelist has that capacity to imaginatively reconstruct, and that's quite powerful. So I think in some ways there's a, a parallel there too. But you don't think that Nassi is imaginatively reconstructing because he's in the moment or because it's, that's the, the role of the artist? Or... In the case of Nasi, yeah. Sorry, I was talking about the novel. Oh, I, yeah, I, I know. I'm just, yeah. I'm just kind of curious whether that also applies to someone that's in the moment and creating art in the moment. Ah, right. That's a good question. I hadn't thought about that. Um, oh, Joanna's here to say today. Yeah, maybe Joanna has an answer to that. <laughs> Still muted, Joanna. <laughs> Joanna, you are muted. 
Apologies. We can't hear you. Actually. I'm on a I'm a, on a different I'm on a different computer here. Sorry about that. I was just remembering uh, doing research years ago in a, in a YIVO archive in New York, uh, and um, uh, finding the papers of a completely crazy organization called the Freeland League. I don't know if you've if you've come across them, but they mm -hmm. they were they were kind of founded I think in the 20s. I can't remember now, but basically they were looking for places to take large numbers of Jewish refugees, I think originally from thinking about moving them from Eastern Europe, pre-Nazi period. And they were looking for areas where they could colonize them and there weren't black inhabitants. So for example, they were really interested in a, in a place uh, in Kimberley in uh, Western Australia, which is still, you know, uh, uh, would be a very difficult place to go. And they had, they had all sorts of really kind of racist, uh, uh, descriptions of where you could or couldn't put uh, Jewish refugees uh, for pioneering projects as well as for um, uh, sort of for pioneering projects for, for young Jews who need who they felt would need to leave as well as for refugee settlement so that was just one thought and the other thought was that um, during the Evian conference I had not been aware of the Haiti offer of course I knew about the Dominican Republic offer and it would I'd be very interested in looking at it more because quite often these offers were would would again work for pioneering um, young refugees who were able to either work the land or be entrepreneurial enough to start up small businesses, which of course many did in many of the Caribbean colonies. But for the older, more desperate uh, refugees who left in the very you know the last moments when they could, including Claude Levi Strauss on in his voyage. It would have been really difficult or virtually impossible to have found anything more than a temporary refuge, say in Haiti, before they were able to move on to somewhere, uh, somewhere else. Right, right. Yeah, I'm, I've I've been also um, trying to understand why the Dominican Republic offer is remembered, but the Haitian offer is not. I, I keep looking for discussions of it and not finding not finding them. And I don't know if it's because it didn't materialize. The Americans shut it down in the Haitian case. I, I think partly because they were fearful of just what you were mentioning, that they would move on from Haiti to try to come to the US. Um, I, I'm not sure I understand the full story there yet of why the Americans didn't allow that to go forward. But um, but even so, I still think it's kind of striking that the, that the Dominican Republic offer is, is studied and talked about and the Haitian offer is is not. Um, and and what's I um, I just have in front of me the Haitian delegate to the Evian conference. Um, one of uh, the speech that he made, and it's really interesting how when he he puts forward um, the Haitian perspective, he couches it in the context of the Haitian revolutionary tradition, and he says that Haiti has always shared in all international movements to promote the freedom and well-being of humanity. So Haiti seems to have been trying to promote its national identity as a place, a haven for the oppressed coming out of its revolutionary history. And it's so fascinating, you know, that it does that. And yet our perception of Haiti is so much so different from that, even right now with the story in the news of, of the missionaries um, being uh, kidnapped in Haiti, you know, the the the, the news narrative, the media narrative is this of the Haiti as a failed state, a chaotic place and so forth. And this really challenges that idea. And I think in a way, D'Alembert in the novel is also trying to challenge that image of Haiti by reminding us of this, or not even reminding, bringing this story forward that isn't, isn't known. I think that's absolutely right. And I think America shutting it down is probably the right, uh, the, the right interpretation because also the British shut down any possibility of, for example, Jewish immigration to British Honduras or British mass migra uh, or Jewish migration to uh, to British Guyana at the time, uh, even though they kind of offered it post Evian, but they didn't really. And I just remember a quote from Moyne in the Royal Com in the West India Commission, looking at the poverty around the Caribbean and what could be done to ameliorate it. And uh, he said in the commission notes that it was such a shame that that they didn't that they shut down the possibility of Jewish immigration because who knows what kind of creative opportunities could have emerged from some of that meeting, you know, of European yeah. and Caribbean yeah. migrations. Yeah, exactly. There, there was a, a long history of um, possible Jewish migration to these uh, various areas in the Caribbean and the Africa. In Africa, the Friedland League was an extension of the Jewish territorial organization. 
and uh, the British uh, had a long history of, of shutting down any of these uh, uh, possibilities for Jew uh, essentially for Russian and Romanian Jews. Um, but at the time, and, and this is quite right what you said, Joanne, at the time Jews constructed themselves as white and uh, saw themselves as a version of white uh, co uh, colonists. Whereas of course, during the war, I think all of that uh, um, was utterly disrupted, the idea of Jews being white. So, um, but there is a long history of, of the British closing down these possibilities. Um, I think someone's writing on the Friedland League, someone's writing on the Jewish Territorial Organization post-war, and, and that's, I think that book's pretty imminent. And on that, um, you know, the question of Jewishness and whiteness, which is of course so thorny, and, and Joanna could speak to this much better than, than I can, but, um, you know, in the context of the Dominican Republic's offer, the, the desire to whiten the population by admitting these Jewish refugees, there's so many contradictions and ironies in that given what, what the refugees were fleeing. And we can extend that also back into the colonial period to think about Jews as colonists and are, you know, are they white or not? And, um, and including in Haiti where there was a Jewish presence in, in the colonial period as well. Uh, although with the Code Noir, there was the expulsion of uh, Jews at least um, officially from the French islands. So we can, there's so many layers that we can kind of bring into this and contradictions around those, those very questions. Sounds like a good time for the parks to make a conference on this. Thank you. Joanna, and thank you, Brian, for the questions, and thank you, Sarah, again for a, a wonderful paper. It's it's twenty past, so I think unless there are any more questions, we should probably allow you to get on with your day, Sarah. Um, <laughs> um, Claire, is there anything you would like to add as director of parks? Anything to promote? Yeah. So really, uh, well, first a massive thank you for this fantastic. Uh, presentation and for well thank you to zoom to bringing you from Canada to us and so much I mean I don't know uh, well, inspiration and analysis and uh, I would like to um, advertise our next event which will be in two weeks time co-organized with the Birkbeck Institute for the study of anti-semitism it will be quite interdisciplinary too. So we will look at uh, four different anti-Semites and how they were actually memorialized in national narratives and national history. Uh, and uh, in a month, we will have the interface lecture with Yulia Yegorova and Brian Klug and Ayman Alzetani, and we will discuss uh, Jewish-Muslim relations in Britain. So it's all on our website. And uh, Stephen Morton from English, do you want to advertise anything from the English department? Yes, thank you. Uh, just to echo as well, um, Claire's thanks to Sarah for a wonderful talk and uh, good to see uh, you all uh, here virtually today. And nice to see you, Brian. I haven't seen you for a while. Nice to hear your uh, thoughts and response uh, to Sarah's talk. Um, yeah, just uh, a, a quick um, kind of plug of some English events that are coming up. So um, next week uh, on October 25th, we have uh, Writers in Conversation event with uh, Susmita Bhattacharya, uh, who's going to read from her short fiction and discuss her writing uh, with Carol Burns. That's in Lecture Theatre A here at the Avenue campus. Um, also coming up later um, this semester uh, in November, we have a research conversation on genetics and culture with Sophia Bull and Claire Hansen. That's an English film event on, on genetics in TV and contemporary fiction. And then an event, another research conversation coming up in December uh, on uh, cultures of the sea uh, with uh, Philip Hoare, 
Stephanie Jones and Matt Kerr, which promises, I think, to be quite fascinating. And um, a, two gig, a to be confirmed um, event, uh, we hope at some point in February, uh, which will be a research conversation on uh, research in the BBC archives between our very own James Jordan and uh, James Proctor, who's uh, been doing some work on um, post-colonial uh, writers and, and the BBC, um, which promises to be fascinating. So yeah, just to give you a sense of what's coming up, that's me. Thanks again, Sarah. Thank you so much, Stephen. And thank you everybody for joining and for your questions and for, yeah, and a massive <laughs> clap from us. Have a good day and a good evening, everybody.